Welcome, everyone. <laughs> Glad you're here. It's a privilege for me to be here. And I have been, I, I love looking at the cosmos. And 
I, I, I think we get carried away with the cosmos sometimes. Because people say, well, we see these black holes and they put this fear in us that, okay, this black hole is coming, going to come and take us. <laughs> well, Jesus says that I'm coming back for my people. And if a black hole, according to the scientists, gets near the earth, we're not going to be anymore. So who controls the cosmos? God does. So if there's a black hole out there, don't pay any attention to these scientists. God has got to have a people to come back for. He said in His Word that His bride has made herself ready. That's Revelation 19.7. So if there's no planet here to make ourselves ready, then, then there's a problem with God's Word. When Jesus was going across the lake after He had preached the sermon, He had fed 5,000 people, He preached the sermon, and He got in the boat, and he said, we're going across the lake. And that's when the storm came up. And uh, the disciples thought they were going to die. So they woke Jesus up. He says, oh, you have little faith. But what did Jesus tell them before? He says, we're going to the other side. But they didn't have faith in his words. That he says, we're, we, we're going to the other side. Now, Jesus said he's coming back for a people. Do we believe he's coming back for that people? Amen. Now, the galaxies, the scientists, I don't, they have trouble because a, several years ago I, I was looking at the, at the cosmos and reading about the cosmos and they said, oh, there's about like 200 billion, 200 billion galaxies in the universe. 200 billion? And there's like a trillion stars in some of those galaxies. It says that the fewest stars in the smaller galaxies is like 10 million. You can't even fathom those numbers. Now, these, the, the biggest galaxy is, has a trillion stars in it. Now, think, well, when God spoke, and this is what I want to talk about, the power of God. Now, God spoke these planets. He spoke in the word when the when the words left his mouth, there wasn't a second between the word leaving his mouth and then and then these things being created. Hallelujah. If you think there's any time between there, then I'm afraid to say you're an evolutionist. That it, it, that it took some evolution. So God's in his word. In uh, Psalm 33, verse 6, it says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made. It says, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. And 30, Psalm 33 verse 9 says, he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. So how much time is between commanded and it stood fast? There's like none. There's no seconds between. Now, if you think about God's creation, how fast this creation is, we have these two trillion galaxies with some planets, I mean some galaxies having a trillion stars. Just think of how many planets are in there. And God, it says, we live and move and have our being in God. He controls everything. God is not in everything, but His power controls everything. Don't get me wrong. He is not in the sun, but His power controls the sun, controls the planets. I mean, He's got all this stuff going on, and He's controlling all of it. You know how many cells are in the human body? Some people say 40 trillion. Some people say 50 trillion. Some people say 100 trillion cells. God says He knows every hair on your head. That's way beyond our thinking. We cannot think that way. God keeps up with every detail, every minute detail. God is never caught off guard. Amen. Now, you think about when He created Adam, the first man. If you read in the Greek, I don't use too much Greek. If you read in the Greek, I was taught this by one of my favorite friends, one of my best friends. Um, he said that when the, when the word was pinned down that it says that 
the Bible says that he breathed the breath of life into Adam. If you look at the Greek, it's the breath of lives was breathed into Adam. And when God made Adam, do you think that the genetic code for every human being that's ever been made was in Adam? Absolutely. Amen. Where did all the races come from? Adam. Where did all the skin colors come from? Adam. God can run all this vast universe so he can act, he can can he put all this in one man? Amen. So as as the people moved out into the world, as they got closer to the equator, some got darker, some went north, it, they got colder. So all these different variations were in Adam. So that was not a problem. But some people want to put other races on the planet. But our Bible doesn't teach the races, other races. Now, if you will talk to some people who have figured out how to put races on the ark, other races of beings, don't listen to that hogwash. Make them show you from Scripture. Make them contextually and grammatically, not just come up with a, a, a word here and there that other races got on the ark. So what, I, what I'm getting at is God's creative power. That is what it's all about. That is why I'm standing up here today, because if it wasn't for God's power, you wouldn't see Ricky Hatcher standing in a pulpit speaking about the Word of God. The Word of God is, is it, that's, that's, where it's, that's what it's all about. Amen. When God speaks, His Word has created power. Yes. God created something from nothing. I mean, nothing. He spoke. There was nothing. After He spoke, it was there. How, why, the only way that we can believe that is we have got to have what Jesus calls faith. Now, if we go, that, that's, this is what the sermon is all about. Is faith. Now, there, one thing that I wanted to point out, if there were other races of beings on the planet when Adam was here, Romans 5.18 would not work. Do we know, does it, uh, let's go to Romans 5.18. I've got it right here. It says, Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men. Now, that wouldn't be fair if there was another race of beings over here because it says the judgment came to all men. So, it resulted in condemnation. Even though, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men. So, Jesus Christ, it resulted in justification of life is what Jesus did for us. Now, the only, the best way I could ever describe this it's probably better ways. I'm not a theologian, but I, I have my own. This is Ricky's way of describing things. Now, if the human race <coughs> were a river, it's, it's an entity. The human race is a river. Adam started this river. And we're all uh, linked together. We're all part of this river. When Adam sinned, it polluted the whole river. Yes. The whole river is polluted. It's like, you don't want to swim there. But where are you going to go? You're a human being. You're Adam's offspring. Now, when Jesus came in Galatians 4, 4, it says, He was born of a woman. Born under the law. Jesus' Father is the Holy Spirit. We, we can never, never forget that. Jesus is God. But he was as much God had He never been man. And he was, he was as much man had he never been God. Let's not forget that. There, there's so many things that, that what you've got to do is you've got to study for yourself to understand these things. I, I can stand here and talk to you about them. If you don't study them for yourself, you're just going to leave out of here and, and you're just going to forget what I said. But learning about the incarnation of Jesus is incredible. 
God took Jesus and he plugged him into this humanity, this river of humanity. Amen. And guess what it did to the river? It cleaned the whole river. Amen. But does that mean everybody's going to be in heaven? No. No, because not everybody believes it. And this is the major problem with human beings. They don't believe what God says. I mean, when you start looking at the cosmos and, and you, you start looking at the power of God, you, you start to think, well, where is the answer? Well, i got news for you. The answer is right here. But men have been cracking this open for thousands of years. This is the upsetting part. We are still here. Now, Enoch, look at Enoch. What did it say about Enoch? It said he pleased God and God took him. He walked with God and God took him. Now, how many people have been taken by God that we know of from Scripture? Not too many. Yeah, two. There's Enoch that we know about. We're talking about the Old Testament. And Elijah, he took them before they died. They didn't have to die. Enoch pleased God. That proves to me that God wanted to take the human race to heaven before the flood. But there was there was everybody there was so much unbelief. It's, it's incredible to, 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 to be on the edge of the garden and see the Garden of Eden and see how man has fallen so short that God said, I repent of making man. And he floods the earth. And he starts the human race over with eight people. An incredible thought. There's, um, God uses people that are, he uses everybody. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are, he can use you. You can have the highest IQ on the planet or the lowest. God can use you. Now, there's this little story. I love this story. And most of you, maybe all of you have heard it before, but just don't tell anybody until I'm done. <laughs> but it's just a simple little story. It's not going to take that long. We're, we're, running, we're fastly running out of time, and i got a lot more to say. There was a company. It was a multi-million dollar company. And these... Um, their, their product, I, I, I can't remember the name of the company, I can't remember what was in the boxes, but their machines were loaded with the boxes, and every now and then they would miss a box, so a customer would get an empty box. So they spent millions of dollars trying to figure out how can we keep this from happening. And uh, that, they finally came up with a thing that weighed the boxes as they go across. Well, the CEO of the company decided to go down to see how this new thing was working out. And he goes down to this little machine, and, it, and the boxes come across in a conveyor. And they come across fast, and this thing's supposed to weigh them real fast. Well, he goes down there, and he looks on the floor, and there's like a ton of boxes laying on the floor. And they're not even being weighed by this two gazillion dollar machine that they designed and put in. And he's looking at it. And the janitor was tired of picking up the boxes. Wait a minute. How'd it go? The janitor saw a problem. And how he fixed the problem, this $2 million machine or $10 million machine was not weighing the boxes right. Somebody correct me if I'm telling this wrong. So what the janitor did is he got one of them, uh, a Walmart fan, and he set it up on a table. And when them boxes came by and they were empty, the fan blew them off. <laughs> I, say, I say that to tell you that you know, even the lowliest of us are, the, are the, the smartest of us. God can use every one of us. Amen. Now, Marty read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. And I'm reading from the, 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 New, the New English Translation. And I study with the King James Bible and the New King James Bible. And I love reading the New English Translation. I've been told that that is the most accurate from the early manuscripts. 
I don't know that. This is what I've been told. And I like the way, because it reads like I read. But if you've got any Bible you use, God can speak to you through that Bible. Amen. You know, in first, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 21, it says that, that God moved, holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit as they pinned down the words of Scripture. The Holy Spirit is your teacher now. I am not your teacher. Our, you know, other teachers that are in here, they're not your teachers. God is using us to teach you. <laughs> he is our teacher. Amen. You've got to dig in yourself. You can't listen to what I'm telling you. You've got to look it up. I could be lying to you. How do you know I'm not lying to you? For the message of the cross, this is uh, verse 18, for the message of the cross to those who are perishing, let me start that over, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The wisdom of the wise. And I will thwart the cleverness of the intelligent. Where is the wise man? Where is the expert in the Mosaic law? Like, like I said, we have been cracking these scriptures over for thousands of years. And we're still here. I am not saying there's anything wrong with this. There is nothing wrong with the Word of God. It's perfect as far as I'm concerned. What God has done for us is He has sent us not a correction for this, but He sent a correction for our thinking. Amen. And He has sent us something that is more valuable than anything except for this. More valuable. The spirit of prophecy. And when it says God's power is in His Word, now listen to me carefully. Where did the spirit of prophecy get the Word? From God. God's power is in His Word. Amen. God has steered a correction for humanity in the spirit of prophecy. He should have been able to do it with this. If Enoch could have went home, even the, even the, the men and women that pinned this down did not get translated. They were the if if they could trans they didn't have to translate their own word they knew what they, they knew what they were putting in here they didn't have to think about it oh what does God mean here what does God mean there I'm not trying to belittle the scriptures and I'm not trying to belittle the people that pin the word down they were human beings just like you and me if you look at the story of Isaiah you look at Isaiah he goes into heaven like he's like like he's all that. And he takes one glance at God. I bet he doesn't even get a glance out. And he falls down like a dead man. The human race is so bent on themselves, selfishness and unbelief, that they cannot get into this word that God has given us. God has offered us His power to get into His word. It is His power. He has given us the faith. There is a saying in the Spirit of Prophecy that goes like this. And this is why I love the Spirit of Prophecy so much. Listen real close. Let's see if I can say it without having a look. The knowledge of what the Scripture means when trying... The scholars... The, the knowledge of what the Scripture means... I'm going to have to look at it. Look at it. <laughs> the knowledge of what the Scripture means is gone. <laughs> I know we don't have time to sit here and think about it. Or y'all wait for me to, uh, to think about it. So I'm just going to find it and want to read it. 
I say I'm going to find it, I'm going to read it. The knowledge of what the scripture means. I know I'm repeating myself. An urging upon us the necessity. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Raymond. When, when, okay. The knowledge of what the scripture means, when urging upon us the necessity of cultivating faith is more essential than any other knowledge that can be acquired. Amen. The knowledge of, of faith. God is trying to urge faith on us. God has given us all, we've all got faith, but are we cultivating that faith? Amen. That is where it is. We have got to allow, how do we, we cultivate that faith? Now, when Jesus went to Capernaum, there was a centurion. And this is one of the most incredible stories that we read right over. And it's such a short story. We read right over it. He says, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. He says, and Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. So Jesus is going to go heal that guy. Boom, just like that. And the centurion stopped him. He said, Lord, now this is a Roman centurion. Think about a Roman centurion. He's not even a Jew. And he's calling Jesus Lord. That is just, you don't read those, that kind of stuff in the scriptures. He says, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak the word and my servant will be healed. He says, for I am also a man under authority, having soldiers under me. He says, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does that. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such faith, not even in Israel. Israel, all of Israel, he has not found the faith that this Roman centurion has. What is it that this Roman centurion, I mean, he just, it's like, like, it's like this pen right here. When I let go of that pen, I had to, I have faith enough that it would drop to the floor. <laughs> I mean, if it didn't, it's a problem. <laughs> I mean, Jesus has raptured us away. But that was that's the kind of faith the centurion had. I mean, he, I'm not gonna drop it again, but. You understand? He had that kind of faith. He believed what Jesus said. If we can understand that the, the act of faith, and that's a simple thing. We talk about that on Saturday afternoons a lot uh, at my mother-in-law's, Audrey's home. And we study faith. Now, Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Amen. Now, what did we talk about in the beginning of this sermon? It was God's creative power. How He just created everything. So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now, the scholars, this is why I would rather, I, 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 I like to study these scriptures on my own, and I do like to study with people, but God sent us a most precious message through the spirit of prophecy, and, and the spirit of prophecy tells us that these two messengers had heavenly credentials with a heavenly message, and the whole world has missed it. So, do we wait 2019, we're going to come up, is God going to send us another message? Why would, is God going to send us another, what, is God going to send the Jews another Messiah? 
what do they need to do? They need to go back in 2,000 years and look at the message that God sent them. They need to look at Jesus. they got to go back 2,000 years. They missed their Messiah. They're looking for a Messiah. What do we need to do as Adventists? We need to revive the message.